so now you've heard the voice. And I want to recognize a few questions. We'll try to do it by hands as long as people agree to be respectful and to be concise and to give Professor Judy a chance to answer a real question. I did have one that I was going to ask him, and I, I'll take the privilege. And the question we ask at most of programs in the Jewish world is, is it good for the Jews? That's the universal question. And a lot of these fault lines that you spoke to us about are, are revelations for many people in the room. There's certainly nothing we've had any experience of exploring. And the question is always in the air, is it good for the Jews or not? After all, if the Shia and the Sunni are fighting each other, does it mean that they've changed their attention or do they simply blame, as you say, blame America, but also by extension blame Israel, blame the world Jews for the problems that they're facing? How does it play out in this relationship between Jews and Muslims? You know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm really being here, and I, 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 I really, I plead ignorance. I, I should have been I, much more knowledgeable about who you are, and I'm, I'm delighted. No, no, really, I, I'm delighted. Really, I, I want to reiterate because you really give me hope. I mean, is my limited experience in the last few hours that, and I want you to know. Uh, you give me hope because I think people like you, and I'm not being patronizing in any way, truly, that, that really uh, make a difference. Uh, make a difference because despite, I mean, I, I think what we need to understand that yes, there are major internal fault lines in the region, but the Palestinian-Israeli conflict still lies at the heart of what I call the major fault line in the region. The major fault lines in the region because the Arab-Israeli conflict has sapped the energy of the region. The Arab-Israeli conflict has poisoned civilization relations between Muslim and Jews. I don't need to tell you that some of us minorities who were born there, uh, I mean, we, we, we basically, uh, again, you know the history more than uh, the great persecutions, the great religious wars that devastated the Western world, the great, I mean, uh, did not take place in that part of the world. Uh, uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years in that part of the world, we lived in peace. We lived in harmony. We were embraced by our fellow Muslims. And I, I, I again, I, I know what I'm going to say is a cliche. I can tell you what an embracing, what a tolerant world that world was and is. There are major problems there, absolutely. Political problems. There are bloody dictators, uh, yes. But at the same time, the Arab-Israeli conflict really lies at the center. Uh, at, and that's why I think, yes, we need to find ways and means to resolve other conflicts, but we also need to keep our focus on this particular fault line, try to nudge the Palestinians and the Israelis. I know it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy to do. Uh, but we need to do everything in our power. We need to lobby our governments. We need to, each one of us really has a role to do in order to basically end the shedding of Jewish and Palestinian blood. Because by doing so, we can really focus then on the question of dictatorship, on the uh, uh, predominance of dictators, on the dismal economic performance, on the failed uh, um, uh, social and, and political and economic institutions that part of the world. My take on it, Adam, is that really the Arab-Israeli conflict also provides ammunition to militants on both sides in order to really perpetuate this particular conflict tense. Again, I mean, it's very easy. Question. <coughs> question is, I mean, any particular advice for? Hillary Clinton is elected. <laughs> <coughs> she calls him into his office. What particular advice? I mean, we would give. We would give all of us to the new president of the United States, and he mentioned in particular, uh, I mean, a Democrat. Uh, 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 I want you to know that it, it's the, the easiest job is to be a critic. I mean, I, because we 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 can bark. And we, I mean, what we say, um, uh, I, I think, and I, 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 I want to put some, some, hype, some arguments on the table. I think extracting our forces from Iraq now in a gradual and timely fashion is a priority. 
the, the American. So, I mean, uh, I, I, again, I, I, I don't need to tell you our very presence is really radicalizing. I, I'm not concerned about militant opinion. I'm concerned about mainstream opinion. I'm concerned about how the United States is getting deeper and deeper in Iraq. There must be a way out, and, but that's the question, how do you do it? Because you don't want to create a vacuum. You have to fill the security vacuum, the result. And this is really the challenge, the challenge facing the, the next president of the United States. I think the next issue, I would say, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, I would say, again, from a, from, from, from a variety of perspective, that the, the, the ending, the, the, the shedding of Jewish and Palestinian blood must stop for a variety of reasons. I would say also, Mr. President, you must keep a healthy distance from the bloody dictators that have bled the region dry. Uh, I mean, look at our uh, allies now. I mean, look at our allies. And I mean, we, after 9-11, we thought that we, we had learned our lesson. Our allies are the Mubaraks, uh, the Saud family, the Algerian president, the Musharraf. Those are our allies. And that's why what I need to tell you, the reason why, I mean, Muslim public opinion is very cynical about American foreign policy. On the one hand, we say we are there to promote democracy. On the other hand, Muslim public opinion turns around and look at what the United States maintains and sustain in power. And look, when, the, when elections take place, and when the people speak, look at how, how we behave. And this is why the dichotomy between our own discourse and our actions as well. That's why keeping a distance from bloody dictators, making the promotion net of democracy, I would say, human rights and the rule of law. I mean, those are important values in order to really bring about the achievement of democracy. Extracting our American forces from Iraq, pushing seriously for a settlement on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, security for Israel, and a Palestinian state by, I mean, the international community maintains that, and making human rights and the rule of law, and, and investing in the rejuvenation of institutions really are top priorities. I mean, uh, the question is, you're talking about Arabs and Muslims who come and live in the United States. And yeah, of course, I mean, there's, I mean, I, I really can't answer this question. I can tell you about my own, my own views. I mean, I, I think uh, this is really a question that, uh, I mean, has to be answered in, in various communities. Again, I don't think we can talk about Iraqis or Palestinians or Pakistan is as a monolith. You have different, um, various, I mean, differing views within the communities. Uh, I basically, let me give you my own take on it. Um, as, as what was the question? The question, I think, uh, may I be blunt? The question was, or is a loaded question, that somehow Arabs and Muslims who come to the United States and to live in the United States still basically entertain uh, similar conspiracy views about America. Am I correct? If they do, if they do. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I, what I really would like to see, I really would like to see the Arab and the Muslim co community to be at the forefront of fighting militancy and extremism in that part of the world. I really would like to see the Arab and Muslim community deeply engaged in American society, deeply involved in the political process and the social process. I like to see the Arab and Muslim community bridges being built between your community and the Arab and Muslim community. And I think really all of us really have, and I asked Adam earlier about bridges really, and we, I, I, what you need to understand too, I want you to know myself as a first generation American, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you always feel insecure. I mean, this is the sense is that it's really going to take a generation for the community to feel at home, to feel to be able to feel secure, you know how it is. And that's why I think all of us really have responsibilities. Responsibilities to learn from each other and also help, I mean, construct bridges to each other. Um, and yes, some of the, I mean, some of the Arabs and Muslims who come to America still entertain similar, probably, uh, reductionist views about America. But I would say 
as you know, the Arab and Muslim community is one of the most growing communities in America, one of the most integrated communities. The polls, the surveys we have is that, in fact, it feels at home in America. And in fact, really, they have nothing uh, but, I mean, success in America. And the views predominant, predominant is that America is the homeland. Uh, there are no, they have no insecurities, no complexities whatsoever. And if the trend continues, I would say you're talking about a very well consolidated community that hopefully will play a major role, not only in fighting militancy, but also in promoting the deep values we all subscribe to, human rights and the rule of law and the promotion of democracy as well. Thank you, thanks for the question. I mean, really, I, I think at the heart, thanks for really forcing me to be a bit conceptual, to, to, to contextualize, I mean, the, the, the desperate remarks uh, I made. I think really, if there is one particular point about my presentation is that I think it's what I call the crisis of the political economy crisis that basically lies at the heart of what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, we're talking about a, a political economic crisis. Um, as you know, the post-colonial state, the post-colonial state that came into being in the Middle East, in, in particular in the late 1940s, I mean, the hope, the dream, was that the post-colonial state would basically create a new order, a new order dramatically different from the colonial order that existed in the region. As you know, after the, uh, after the demise of the Ottoman Empire in 1918, Britain and France basically divided the region into nation states and created, and created the nation state and Britain and France was basically in charge of the destiny of the existing governments up till the late 1940s, mid 1950s. And the post-colonial state, I mean if there is really one particular, I mean the tragedy about the region itself is that the dismal failure of the post-colonial national state. And this is really the underlying, I mean, factor in my presentation. I mean, look at what happens today in the Middle East. I mean, the ultimate failure, actually, of the post-colonialist colonial state is not their inability to deliver the goods, but rather their dismal failure to create a national community. National community, a community based on a social com contract that transcends ethnic, parochial, tribal, and religious beliefs. And this is really the tragedy. I mean, look what happened in Iraq between 1958 and 2003. I mean, here you have Saddam Hussein, who comes from a particular, instead of the post-colonial state creating a, an Iraqi identity, a national identity, a, a unified identity, unified national community, Saddam Hussein and the Assads and the various dictators basically played on the ethnic and tribal divisions in order to consolidate their authority itself. And as a result, now, Arab and Muslim societies have never been as divided and splintered as they are today. And this is really the ultimate tragedy of the post-colonial state. It came, to, it came to power in the late 1940s in order to create a national identity, a social contract. What you have now is that you have multiple communities, multiple ethnicities, multiple tribes, multiple civil wars that shaking the very regional order to its very foundation. I mean, Egypt, whoever believed in Egypt now, I mean, there's a debate about the Shia threat in Egypt. Uh, in Yemen itself, you have a war between the, the, the Shia and the Sunnis. I mean, there is, I mean, for, I, I was in Yemen um, for two, three months. I used to wake up every morning on the sound of fighter jets, the government basically bombing the Shia areas in Yemen uh, itself. And this tells you about the dismal failure of the, uh, I mean, post-colonial state itself not only to deliver the goods, I mean, we can forgive them if basically made mistakes in terms of social and economic policies, but basically manipulating, manipulating ethnic and tribal and religious identities in order to consolidate and perpetuate 
their authoritarianism in the region. Think of how much you've learned tonight. <laughs> now imagine how much you'll learn tomorrow. I want to again thank Professor Jirgis. <laughs> <laughs>